crazy and all of a sudden things are going to turn around for them and, and all of a sudden all these people that you love dearly, they're going to come into the kingdom because your whole house is going to be saved and we go, yes, God told me this, but then over the next few months and next few years, things seem to get worse. It's like they get crazier and, and, and those are things that are trying to frustrate you and cause you to get so weary that you give up and you stop believing. God may have given you a promise about a business and the business starts and you're like Peter, you're out of the boat, but now you're out on the water and all of a sudden you feel like you're sinking and things are falling apart and you're like, God, I don't know what to do right now because of this. God, I, I, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling weary. I, I've gotten disappointed too many times. I've gotten discouraged too many times. And I, I literally feel right now that I'm so weary that I'm going to faint. See, we love the promise and we love the fulfillment. But in between is where real Christianity is. Real Christianity is where the rubber meets the road on Monday. Real Christianity is on Sunday. Real Christianity is how do I walk this out on the job? How do, how do I do this with my family? How do, I, how do I do this in everyday life? Because Sunday we can fake. Sunday we can put the smile on like everything is just great and, and, and we lift our hands even in worship and the whole time we're exhausted, we're weary, we're emotionally drained, we, we've had people pulling on us and, and we've got all these things that God promised and we're like, God, when is this going to happen? I know you said it, but when is there going to be a manifestation? I want you to think about this. Do you know that weariness to where you almost feel like fainting is actually a signpost of how close you are to your due season. Matter of fact, all through scripture, I mean, can you, can you imagine being Noah? I mean, God tells them there's rain coming. I want you to start preparing a boat. And for 40 years or, and, or more, he goes in and he preaches to the people. Um, matter of fact, Hebrews says he was a preacher of righteousness. He's declaring to them rain is coming and they'd never even seen rain. They're like, this guy's lost his mind. He doesn't have one convert. I guarantee it was probably difficult enough to get his sons and daughters-in-law to even believe how crazy this old boy was. I mean, he's talking about stuff coming out of the sky we've never even seen coming out of the sky. You talk about getting weary in doing good. Imagine being Joseph. Joseph gets a, a promise from God as just a teenage boy that he's going to rule one day and his bro brothers are going to bow before him and all of a sudden he ends up in a pit. And he's delivered out of the pit and he ends up in Potiphar's house. Then, then at Potiphar's house where he's falsely accused, he ends up in prison. I mean, I want you to think about that. I don't know about you, but I can handle the pit. I've been thrown into pits by brothers. I've had people that have been close to me that have thrown me away. I've been, I've been lied about many times. I have been accused of things that I had nothing to do with and didn't even do. And I could handle all that. But then prison? It's like, come on, you can't tell me Joseph wasn't in there. Like, Really? Seriously, God? I mean, you, you, you promised this, and I know you said there's a due season for me, but now I'm stuck in prison. But if he had never been in prison, he would have never met the baker, and he would have never met the butler, because it was in that season that he met the person that unlocked his due season. See, right now we're entering a new season. It's called new, new normal all over the world and around our culture. And maybe our new season is a due season. Rather than looking and focusing on the negative, maybe what God is wanting to do fresh right now in our lives is he's wanting to strengthen us in the midst of this. And rather than be overcome, we actually overcome. And, and how we respond to this, I can't do anything about what happens to me. I can't do anything about all the mess that takes place. I can only do something with how I respond to it. I, I think of King David. He's probably one of my favorite in the Bible because we all can relate with David. He gets a prophetic word from a prophet 
as just a young teenager, the oil pours over his head. And the prophet declares to him, you are going to be a king. And in his natural mind, he's like, man, this guy's lost his mind. You can only be a king if you're a son of a king. I'm not a prince. I, I, I'm just a bastard servant. I'm, I, I'm a concubine son. That's why when, 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 the, when the prophet said to Jesse, bring me your sons, David wasn't even included because he wasn't considered a son because he was a concubine son. Matter of fact, he even tells us in the Psalms that his brothers weren't even really fully his brothers. And in the midst of all of that, he's like, how am I going to be a king? And so he just gets busy serving. He gets busy doing good, doing what his father asked him to do. He brings some bread and he brings some wine and brings some stuff to his brothers and he sees Goliath. And we know the story. That's a famous story. I mean, all of a sudden he defeats Goliath and all of a sudden he's given the daughter of the king. He's like, ah, maybe this is it. I'm now the son-in-law. So maybe, maybe some of the males are going to die off and I'm going to get the king him this way because maybe he's going to give it to the in-law and then all of a sudden in the midst of all of that Saul gets jealous because they said David kills his ten thousands and Saul is thousands and the man who was supposed to be a father to him and teach him how to be a king instead throwing spears at him and started attacking him and then for 15 years David wanders out in the wilderness with a motley crew of a bunch of in debt, distressed, and discontented people. Can you imagine? Thanks for the leadership team, God. I mean, couldn't, couldn't you have sent me a few folks that weren't distressed? A few folks that weren't dead and had, had a couple bucks here and there? I mean, God, you send me this, and, and then he starts winning these battles and these. In debt, distress, and discontented people become these mighty warriors. I mean, they're willing to break through whole armies just to get them a cup of water. I mean, he's got some guys that, that, that defeat lions and pits on snowy days. I mean, he got some bad boys running with them now. And in the midst of all that, they come to a place called Ziklag. Ziklag means the place of winding or twisting or turning. I call it the turning point. And at Ziklag, while he's off warring, he comes back. And an enemy had come in, wiped everything out, took all the women and the children as slaves took all of their produce, all of their livestock, and even his mighty men spoke of stoning him. And in the midst of all that, David is probably like, God, are you kidding me? But what David didn't know is he was less than two weeks away from being crowned king. Sometimes when you feel the weariest and you're ready to just give up, and you're ready to throw in the towel. And you're ready to say, you know what? I don't think I can continue doing good. I just feel like being bad for a minute. I know y'all are more spiritual than me. You never feel like that. I just, I just feel like I, I don't want to keep doing all the things that are going to lead to positive things in my life. I just want to give in to some pessimism. I just want to give in. I, I just want to tell that person off. I don't think I want to. I'm tired of loving them. Because they ain't giving me no love back. I'm tired of serving. When's someone going to serve me? I'm tired of being the one that always picks up the check. When's someone going to pick up a check for me? I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this and, and I'm tired of that. And David comes to Ziglag. And the Bible tells us something very powerful. And it's one of the keys that we need to get for today. It says that all of his men spoke of stoning him. And he went to Abiathar which means father of honor. He went to the high priest and he said, what do I do? And the high priest said, you shall pursue this troop and without fail, you will recover all in three days. I mean, you know, David's a beautiful picture of Jesus because he recovered all in three days. But it first says this, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, when you first read that, you're like, well, what does that mean? I mean, so David had a positive confession fit. You know, he looked in the mirror and said, you're a winner. You got it. You can do this, chief. I believe in you. You can, you can defeat this enemy. No, actually, it's the Hebrew word shazak. And the word shazak, it means to conquer yourself, to make yourself, to force yourself, to encourage yourself. How many know you got to make yourself do some stuff sometimes? When you don't feel like doing the right thing, there's sometimes you got to conquer yourself because, again, your biggest enemy is not out there. Your biggest enemy is between your ears. If I can conquer me, everything out here will just fall into place. It's the struggle of conquering our own emotions, our own feelings, our own 
plan, our own designs, our own desires. And when David conquered himself, three days later, he got everything back that was stolen from him. And just a short season later, he is crowned king. In other words, his due season, his prophetic fulfillment, the promise of what God said was that far away. But if he would have given up at that season, he would have missed that opportunity. Now, let me give you good news. If God promises you something, he never takes the promise away. There's times the promise is ready for a fulfillment, but we faint and we miss it, but he brings it back around. He told the children of Israel, I've got a promised land for you. They didn't go in because of unbelief, because they didn't mix the promise. They didn't mix it with what? Faith. They didn't believe. They, they got tired. They got weary. They fainted. They gave up. But God brought it back around. The children of Israel still went into the promised land. But it was now just a different season. And I know there's been times in my life where there's some things God promised me and I missed out on the first opportunity because I fainted. Because I gave up. But this is the beautiful thing about a father. If he promises you something, he don't take it back. He don't say, well, now, you know what? You didn't get it the first time. Now, nan and a boo-boo, you ain't getting it ever. Listen, we, we have a good father. And as a good father, he said, you know what? You might have given up in this season, and you might have stopped believing for that dream. You might have stopped believing for that promise. You might have stopped believing for that business. You might have stopped believing for your family because it looked like things got worse. But I'm telling you, if I promised it to you, I'm going to bring it to pass. And all you, your only responsibility is to simply believe it and not allow weariness and fainting. Do you know... That one of the meanings for the word faint not only is lose heart, but you go back to its root word and it's translated small souled, S O U L E D, or small minded. That means we start to settle for second best. God, you gave me the promise, but you know what? It doesn't look like it's going to happen, so I'll be happy. I, I'll never forget, and I think I shared this story here several years ago. I was preaching in the inner city of Baltimore, Maryland. And I got done preaching, and, and there was a woman, and I had a prophetic word for her. And I said, listen, I heard the Lord say, it's time to take out your list again. It's time for you to write it out again because you've given up. You've stopped believing. You've stopped trusting. But Father wants you to know he's not forgot anything you wrote now. Well, you know, she took off running around the building, getting excited in the organ, going, da -da -da -da, and we, we started having some church. It was fun. <laughs> Afterwards, she comes to my table, and she said, you have no idea. She said, last night... I threw the list away. She said, matter of fact, she said, about 10 years ago, I was given a prophetic word about a future husband. And, and the word was, you need to write down the desires of your heart because God wants to give you the desires of your heart. So she wrote down everything she wanted in a husband and she got excited. So a week went by and he didn't show up and a month and he didn't show up and three months and a year and, and two years. She said, after two years, I started marking stuff off the list. <laughs> I thought maybe, maybe my list is just too big. I'm, I'm asking for perfection. And she said, matter of fact, she said last year, the list went down to two things. God, I just want him saved with a job. Hallelujah. She said, I don't care what color he is. I don't care how old he is. I don't care how young he is. Just saved, got a job, preferably with benefits. Hallelujah. So, so that, that's all I'm concerned about right now in this season. And she said, last night I threw the list away and I gave up. And God looked right at her in that service and says, you need to pull the list back out. Yeah. He's not forgot. It's just that in the journey between the promise and the fulfillment, he got weary. And we all do. I, I, don't, I don't care who you are. We all deal at times with weariness. We get up and we go to the jobs like, oh. We, we, we do things. Listen, wh whether you realize this or not, even in ministry, there's sometimes your pastor don't want to be here. There's sometimes we have to force ourselves to preach to you because we had a week where we don't want to preach to nobody. We don't want to talk to nobody. We don't, we're not sure we like you or even Jesus that week. <laughs> Why? Because we all experience things on different levels depending on how we function and how we live and how we're made up, but weariness will come. You can't keep weariness or trouble from coming, but how we respond to it has everything to do with whether we see the fulfillment manifested. Matter of fact, 
if you want to know what to do with weariness, and I'll, I'll wind this down. Are we doing all right today? Yeah. Am I helping anybody? Yeah. How we respond to it is, first of all, we, we conquer ourselves. We speak to ourselves. Isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it interesting that how we're filled with the Spirit, according to Ephesians, he said, be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit by speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart, giving thanks to the Father. If nothing else, wake up in the morning and put on some worship. Start singing to yourself. Start, start speaking to yourself. That's why James chapter 3, verse 2 tells us, he that is careful in his words keeps his whole body in check. You know that you can literally tell your body how to function? But the words you speak over your own body, over your own life, over all of that has everything to do with then how your brain begins to tell your body how to, how to function. If you wake up in the morning and say, oh, man, this is, a, oh, I'm just exhausted today. You're tired all day. You ever notice that? You're exhausted all day long. Why? Because you just told your body, shut down. You're tired. But in the midst of all that weariness, how we overcome it is we go to Isaiah chapter 40, a very famous verse, and it says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is what I've discovered many times in my life is when I got weary and when I fainted, it's when I was a youth. It's a sign many times of still immaturity in our lives because the youth's faint, not the mature. When we faint, when we give up on believing for the promise, it's normally a struggle in the area where I'm I'm struggling with trust. I'm struggling to believe. And, and let me say this to you. It's okay. It's okay to struggle with believing. It's almost like many of our church cultures around America, we don't talk about doubt. We don't talk about unbelief because it's, it's almost like a bad thing. Oh, no, no, you don't doubt. We all deal with doubt. Matter of fact, the only way you can have real belief is that there's been some unbelief. That's what shows you're believing is because there was first unbelief. Now you believe. And God doesn't freak out when we're struggling in areas of trust with him. When we're trusting him for our finances. We're trusting him for our family. We're trusting him physically. I mean, we're, we're living in a season where, man, there's never been a day we need to see the healing power of God manifest more than today. I mean, folks are dying all over the place. And it's not that God's still not doing work and healing people, but in the midst of it all, we, we, we just get weary with the whole thing, and then we just give up. And it's like, why even pray for anybody? Because it seems like the last 10 people I prayed for died. So why even believe? Why even, why even try? They that wait upon the Lord. Now, you see, this doesn't, this doesn't mean that you just all of a sudden go into a prayer closet and sit around waiting. Do you know what the word there, wait, in Hebrew, gives more an inference of a waiter or a waitress that's busy serving? In other words, he's like, just keep doing good. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't let disappointment keep you from future appointments. Keep loving. Keep serving. Keep giving. Keep keeping on. Don't get stuck between the seed and the harvest and stuck in time. Because God's going to do what he promised you. God's going to do what he said. Matter of fact, that's something that we can take to the bank because he said, I'm not a man, I don't lie. If I told you I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. But your response, you see, when, when, when an angel told Mary you're about to have a baby and she's like, huh? I've never been with a man. He said, your cousin Elizabeth, who was barren, she's not pregnant. Mary's response is, be it unto me according to your word. God, you promised it, and I'm going to believe that. Can you imagine the faith it took for a teenager to believe that she was going to have an immaculate conception? 
It's like, I've, I've never been with a man. Science tells me this can't happen. And yet she not only lined her mouth up with what God said, but then it says she immediately got up and went to a city of Judah. She started praising God about what he said. And then she got around, and I'm going to stop with this. Then she got around someone else who was pregnant. Because the scripture says, let us not be weary. One of the number one things that keeps us from fainting is you have to have people around you that will help you not faint. We were never made to walk alone on this planet. That's why the corporate gathering is still important. Yes, we can watch it online and get ministered to, but there's something about someone next to us that encourages us, that puts their arm around us, that says, listen, I got you because you're not in this alone. Let us not be weary in well-doing, sir. We shall reap if we faint not. Make it a we, not a me. Just know that you're not alone. There's a reason we're called a household of faith, that we're a the family of God because we all need someone to hold up our arms when we feel tired when we feel weary emotionally and physically and spiritually I, I want to just encourage you today your prophetic fulfillment your due season may be a whole lot closer than you imagine and if you feel so weary you're about to faint this is the time to get around some people let them know what you're going through. Stop being a lone ranger. You can't do this by yourself. Be honest with some people. Be transparent and say, listen, man, I'm struggling right now. I need someone to hold up my arms. I need someone to agree with me because if any two agree on earth, not if any one. There's a power in agreement. There's a power when we come together. They that wait upon the Lord. I want to encourage you. Keep doing good. Keep serving. None of this has anything to do with get you, getting you into heaven. Believing in Jesus takes care of that. This isn't a heaven issue. It's not a hell issue. This is a, this is a living, living on this earth purpose issue. And it's about learning how to walk this thing out. Monday through Saturday and all day Sunday. Bow your heads a moment, would you? Father, I thank you today. I, I thank you that... Weariness may come, but weariness doesn't have to stay. We can be strengthened in you and in the power of your might. You know how to release grace to us in our times of incredible need. You know how to bring encouragement to our lives. You know how to help us continue to be faithful when we feel like giving up, when we feel like throwing in the towel, when we feel like just saying, God, I know what you said, but I just can't. I can't see it right now. And then you bring people around us to hold up our arms, to give us grace and give us encouragement. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. Now do something. Would you put your hand on your heart a moment? And I want you to pray something. Give up. Appointment or discouragement. Keep me from moving forward into what you promised. I believe you'll do what you said. I am your child. You don't give up on me. I'm not going to give up on you. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I want you to hear this. You're not alone. You're not alone in this. You don't have to be by yourself. There's a great team here. If, if you don't have anybody else you feel can encourage you, uh, put them to work. Just call them. Tell them, pray for us. Pray with us. Because at times they might feel weary, but they're not going to give up. There's too much that God has still in your future. In Jesus' name. Matter of fact, I want you to turn to at least two or three people and tell them.